Stanford University is one of the world's leading research institutions. The Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford comprises about 50 faculty, including neurosurgeons and neuroscientists, and additionally, about 40 residents, clinical fellows, postdoctoral research fellows, and other students. One of the unique advantages of Stanford University is that all seven schools, including the School of Medicine, School of Engineering, School of Humanities and Sciences, are located on the same campus, along with two world-class hospitals, an adult hospital and a pediatric hospital, situated in the middle of Silicon Valley with all of its resources. The mission of the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford is to improve the health of patients with neurologic disorders through leadership, collaborative discoveries, and innovations in no, patient care, that. research, and education. Stroke is the second most common cause of death in the world and the leading cause of major neurologic disability in the United States. It can be as mild as numbness in a, in a hand, which can have profound implications for functioning in the real world, or as severe as complete paralysis on one side of the body or inability to speak. Until recently, there's been no hope for patients who have had a stroke to recover function. In the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford, we have been pioneering new techniques that for the first time offer promise for recovery of function in these patients. Two of the techniques that we've been focusing on are known as stem cell transplantation and brain-computer interface. Stem cell transplantation for stroke consists of implanting stem cells into the brain of stroke victims surrounding the stroke, which enables circuits that have been previously damaged and non-functioning to function better. We treated 18 patients between September 2011 and September 2013, and we've now followed those patients over the period of time. Some of the patients have shown substantial recovery that has actually already improved their ability to function in the world. Yeah, I had a stroke at 31, and that's really rare. Before, the, there was always a pain in my shoulder, my, and then when I had my surgery, I mean, I went like this, and uh, my, my leg was stronger, and my speech was instantly better. It, it's the best thing I could have done. I'm going to hold it up here, like this, and on the count of three, I'm going to let it go, okay? You try to keep it up. This year, I've got more mobility out of my arm and my hand, and I'm able to lift my leg, my foot for the first time, up off the floor and flex my instep, I guess, crunch my toes, and I, so I know that means there's more flexibility in my foot. It's been two years now, and I still have hope in improving more. The early improvement we see in the patients at six months appears to be sustained at one year. We don't want to oversell this procedure because the results are still preliminary, but we're very encouraged by what we see so far, and this has led us to plan larger studies with increased number of patients. Brain-computer interface is another technique that takes advantage of functioning cells in the brain bypassing cells that are dead or inactive. So it allows signals to be picked up from functioning neurons that can be processed through a computer and the output then can be used to drive a computer cursor or robotic arm, therefore bypassing the paralyzed nervous system. The brain-computer interface system that we're using in this trial is composed of several parts. The first part is a sensor about the size of a baby aspirin with very small electrodes, 100 of them, that penetrate the surface of the brain to a depth of one millimeter. The signals from that sensor are then amplified by a preamplifier that sits on top of the head and screws into a plug that actually goes through the scalp. The signal then is digitized at 30,000 samples per second, and those digital samples are fed into a computer. The, com the computer then takes those samples uh, and builds a decoder. That decoder learns the activity of the brain and uses that brain activity to control a computer cursor on a screen or a robotic arm or some other external assisted device. Now I'm able to move the cursor to uh, play games and move the cursor to 
uh, express my feelings through uh, text input and um, that also uh, means that one can be connected to the internet into the rest of the world playing games or doing the Facebook with other people that means quality of life you know, giving people reason to live I think as we continue to learn more about the brain more about the human brain we're going to be able to continue to improve these systems to the point where they can really be useful for people in their everyday lives so I'm very optimistic about the future